All right, first of all, I just want to thank Pastor Thompson and his family, and of course, all of you here at Church Foundation Baptist Church for having me and my daughter out here. Uh, appreciate the hospitality and the generosity. It's very much appreciated, uh, Pastor Thompson. And um, of course, I wouldn't expect anything less from you. As he mentioned earlier, we know each other for a long time. I actually had to go back and look on YouTube. When you said Genesis 6, I was like, oh yeah, you know, that spark of memory when you came and visited us. And uh, you can thank God that, that uh, Pastor Thompson chose to stay here instead of moving because you were considering potentially moving at that time, right? And that was one of the reasons he was traveling around and looking to see since he was unable to find anywhere to go locally. And, um, you know, thankfully everything worked out with Pastor Jimenez and Verity Baptist Church and being able to start a church up here. Um, obviously, you all be very thankful for having a church like this here. And um, I'm very happy to come out here and, and be able to visit your church. Were you coming out and visiting ours? Uh, I think it was eight years ago is when that was. I looked at, I, YouTube's got, got the, uh, the history still. The Word of Truth Church hasn't been uh, shut down. That's, that is no more current update. So that's still, that's still up there. But Genesis 6 was the second Bible study that we had done. I started in John, then went to Genesis. So that was within pro the first year of our, of our existence as a church then. So anyway, it's very good to be here. I'm not going to ramble on all day about that. And I apologize for not going into, say, 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians. For those of you doing the Bible challenge, um, you're like, I thought I got through all the really long chapters in the New Testament. No, we're going right back to it. Dude. We'll read 71 verses this morning, right? <laughs> but what I am preaching about is it's very important because this story is a long passage in any of the Gospels that we look at it in, uh, the story of uh, Jesus Christ and his arrest. And what I want to preach about this morning and what I want to... Um, just get across and, and hopefully be be edifying as well as uh, exhorting on on your your own spiritual walk with Christ. And the title of my sermon is "Following from Afar." And one of the things we notice here, we're going to be looking between uh, Peter and John in this story and in a few other cases that are that are right around this time as two examples. Now we know that that the apostle Peter and John are both great men of God like great men of God, right? And, and I, wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't even try to compare myself to one of those men as far as the greatness and their servitude to the Lord and, and all the sacrifices that they made and all the great accomplishments that they've had. But we're gonna be looking at Peter here in, in a negative light. You know, there's something that, that he did. You know, this is a, the passage where he ends up denying Christ. And it's important to understand this. So before anyone even tries to turn off the preaching and say, oh, I don't need to listen to this, right? You know, following from afar, there's many, many ways you could think about this, but this is geared towards believers. This is geared towards the saved, okay? Both Peter and John were obviously saved. They were apostles. So if we can see some of these impacts, I'm going to show you some of the negative effects of what happens when you start to follow Christ. He was still following Christ, but he was following from afar. And this is where we, we pick up here. Look at verse number 54 in Luke chapter 22. This is right at the arrest of Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, okay? The Bible says they took him, and of course, all of the disciples fled. Everybody forsook Christ in this moment. But what happens here, it says they took him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house, and Peter followed afar off. So Peter hangs back. Right, kind of thinking he's away from the danger, away from some of the threat. He says, he says well, I still want to follow. I still want to see what's going on, but I'm going to follow from way back here. Peter followed afar off. This is not in here coincidentally or accidentally. You know, this is here on purpose, letting us know that Peter followed afar off. Because what we're going to see also is that there's another disciple that followed, and he followed actually very closely. We'll see that when we get to, to the context story in, in John. But let's keep reading here. I want to show you some things about here. The results of Peter following afar off. And this is before we even get into any more applications about this. Let's look at verse 55 there. The Bible says, And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. So one of the results of Peter following from afar off is now he's just hanging out with and, and just associating with these other, just some of the, what we'll see later, it's some of the, um, the guards and just other people hanging out at, at, the, at the high priest's house and not necessarily the crowd that you want to be associated with. Maybe not the, the worst in the world. I don't know these people, but 
he ends up here. He's definitely not side by side with the apostle that let him in. Because there was another disciple there that actually gained him, got him access through the gate to get into this position to even be able to follow from afar off. And he just kind of hangs back and he doesn't go. He's not hanging out with the guy who's real godly and close to Jesus. He's just just still keeping his distance and staying far away. Verse 56 says, but a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, this man was also with him. So what's happening, he's warming himself by the fire. He's just trying to, trying to get in there and, and be incognito and just pretend like he belongs with everyone else there. And, oh, yeah, I'm just warming myself with you, right? And this, this lady's just looking at him. She's, he earnestly looked at him. So she's just kind of eyeballing him going like, wait a minute. Aren't you one of his followers? So aren't you one of those? Aren't you one of those people that's, that's a Christian? Aren't you one of those people following Christ? I think I've seen you before. And of course, Peter says, you know, he denied saying, woman, I know him not. And after a little while, another saw him and said, thou art also of them. And Peter said, man, I am not. And about the space of one hour after another confidently affirmed saying of a truth, this fellow also was with him for he is a Galilean. And, you know, to this point, it's taking a whole hour. He's still there. He wants to see what's going on, but he's hanging out with these people trying not to blow his cover, as it were. And he's, and he's saying, oh, yeah, I don't know him. I don't know him. And then someone else finally approaches him and, uh, and says, no, look, you're a Galilean. You know, basically, we can tell by the way you're talking. We understand you, you've, you've got to be one of his followers. And Peter said, man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately while he yet spake, the cock crew. And of course, this is, brings to remembrance what Jesus had said unto him about denying him because earlier, he was confidently, practically boasting, saying like, Lord, I will never leave thee. I'm never going to turn my back. I'll be there to the death. I am. I am right there with you. I'm going to serve you. I'm with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. I'm going to be right there. And why is this sermon important? One, because you may have the right attitude right now, and hopefully you do, right? Lord willing, you've got the attitude that says, I am going to serve Christ with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my being, and I am there and nothing will ever come between me and Christ. And look, that is the right attitude to have. That's the same attitude Jesus had, but in the span of like less than a day, that all changed quickly. He went from confidently affirming that he was never going to do anything like that, and, and I believe sincerely in his heart. I mean, that's honestly what he was thinking, like that would never happen to finding himself in this situation where now he's denying he even knows who Christ is. Like, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know the guy. I don't, what do you mean? I, no, I'm not one of his followers. I don't know him. Now, Christ had already told him that he was going to do this. And at the time, he probably blew it off just because he thought that can't apply to me. Right. And again, another lesson to learn when you hear the word of God, when you're seeing what Jesus says, when you're seeing what God says to you, don't blow any of it off as if it can't ever possibly apply to you because then you're not taking heed lest you fall. Right. Right? Let, any, let, let him that think that he standeth take heed lest he fall. Peter thought he stood. We didn't take heed to what Jesus was saying unto him, thinking that would never happen to me. And then what happened? He falls. And now you have this, this great reminder. As soon as he denies him the third time, look at verse 60, 61, the Bible says, and the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. That in itself should, you know, that's sending chills up my spine right now. Just, look, just thinking about, he knew what was going on while Peter, Peter's standing over there, off in the distance, warming himself by the fire. Jesus is being accused and has these people harping on him, bringing false accusations against him. He's got his own thing going on. And then as soon as Peter denies him that third time, he looks over at him. Up to that point, Peter probably assumed he didn't, he, there's no way Jesus could even know he's there. Well, he's the son of God. He prophesied this was going to happen. Of course he knew this was going to happen. And he knew he was there. And then he looks right at him. And that stuck in Peter, and he said, and it says here, um, 
And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. One of the results of following Jesus from afar, you say, well, I want to follow Jesus, but I don't really want to get that. I don't want to get that crazy. I don't want to get that uh, it, uh, close to Christ. I don't want to be that sold out to serving the Lord, following afar off. You know what? You're a lot more likely to come into positions like this where you're going to end up finding yourself weeping bitterly because you, you fall, because you get into sin, because you end up denying Christ, because you're not rooted down and planted where you need to be, where God would have you to be, you're just, you're, you're kind of dabbling and you've got one foot in the world, one foot in the church, and you're going, yeah, I don't really know if this is all really for me. I'd rather just kind of follow Jesus afar off. Well, you don't want to end up like Peter in this situation where he goes out and he weeps bitterly. I'll tell you what, weeping bitterly is, <laughs> if, if, you know, I hope that's, you've never been through that. I've been in there. I've been in that shoes before. You catch yourself, you've, you, you, you've, you've fallen into sin and, and you just are so distraught and broken about it that you end up weeping bitterly. It's terrible. Now, one other point I want to bring up here because just because we're in this passage and um, I'm not going to teach much on this, but I kind of like bringing this up because there's a lot of people who get confused about, um, you know, Peter denying him three times or Deny, you know, the cock crowing once, the cock crowing twice. You have these, these different accounts between the Gospels and in the book of Mark. It says, you know, uh, you'll deny me thrice before the cock crow twice. And I'm not going to go in depth on that, but I just want to point something out here that might be interesting to you in case you've never seen this before. And this is also to point to what we're reading about here as well. So in Luke chapter 22, the three denials that we read about the first one's in verse 56, where it says, a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire. And then the next one, Peter responds, man, I am not. And then the third one, he says, man, I am not. So, you know, talking about their gender. And this is back when you could use pronouns that like were, were legit, right? Like the real ones. So we see here, he's denying to a maid and then he's denying to a man, he's denying to a man. Well, you know, in Mark 14, he denies to a maid, then he denies to another maid. And then it says, they. So all I want to point out here is that he denied Christ even more than three times. So just something to think about. You want to, you'll go back, go back. There's a challenge you do your own study now and compare these back and forth. If you've ever kind of wondered about that or had some issues about the how can it be, the cock crowing twice, the cock crowing once, they're, they're all true. They're both true. And, and one of the ways you get there is because Jesus or Peter denied Jesus more than three times. He definitely denied him three times. And Jesus was making that point to, to let him know, hey, it's going to happen at a certain time. But he denied him more than three times. Now turn, if you would, to John chapter 18. We're going to see another account of this story, John chapter 18. And we're going to start reading in verse number 15. The Bible says, Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple. So we didn't get this context. We didn't get this information in Luke where it just said Peter followed afar, afar off. But here we see Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. So this other disciple, which I'm not going to go in depth and trying to prove this to you, I believe is Apostle John that ends up going in with Jesus. So we're going to see the difference here between the Apostle John who's staying with, you know, look, did he forsake Christ when they came to arrest him? Yes, he did. They all did. Yep. But he quickly comes back and, and, you know, repents basically and just going, you know what? No, I'm going to stay with Jesus now. After he already forsook him, he comes back. Peter, He's kind of going, well, I'm just going to stay back. I'm going to hang back. I'm going to follow from afar off and just kind of see how this all plays out. Now, just because I can't help myself, let's make an application here. Because there's a lot of people when bad things happen. Because what's going on here? Hey, everything's going great. When Jesus is feeding the 5,000 and when Jesus feeds the 4,000, when he's healing people and you have all these great positive things going on, there's all this excitement about the ministry. It's not that hard to follow Jesus. It's not that hard to be with him. 
Nobody is considering following from afar off in the midst of the excitement. Everyone wants to be there. But, but when the government comes in, when the governors and the high priests and the people who can actually do some harm to you and, and, and cost you to even be associated with this man, now all of a sudden it's not quite as popular to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. This is the point where it's going to test your faith and test you to see, well, how do you really want to be close to Christ? How close do you want to be? Or would you rather just be real comfortable and follow him from afar off? Because look, at the end of the day, you have to realize to this end, Christ came to this earth was to be sacrificed and to go through everything that he went through and to be arrested and beaten and spat upon and crucified to that end. That's why he came. And, you know, we're supposed to be Christians, which means Christ followers. We're going to follow Christ. That's why Jesus said, you know, hey, take up your cross and follow me. You have to expect that the hard times are going to come. He demands that we ought to be right there with him. He's willing to work with us. I mean, we should just take that when he says, hey, get in the yoke with me. If he's willing to descend to our level to work with us, who in the world do we think we are to say, yeah, no, I'm just, I'm going to, I'm going to hang back here, Jesus. You know, I kind of want to follow you. I saw it, but, but you know, oh, man, that's a lot of heat. I, I, that's a lot of pressure. You don't understand, Jesus. You don't understand. I've got a family. You don't understand. I've got this good job. You don't understand. I've got all these reasons why I can't be in the news. You've got all these reasons why I can't be associated with Pastor Thompson or Sure Foundation Baptist Church. I mean, do you know what they said about the sodomites? I mean, have you ever heard what he said about, about these reprobates? I don't know if I could be associated. Look, do you want to follow a far off? Or do you want to be right there? And to think of it, if you're going to be right there, if you're going to follow closely, you're going to have to expect that there's going to be difficult times. Yeah. The apostles, you want to be close to Jesus? Well, you got to be there then and understand when the law comes to arrest him and maybe arrest you and maybe want to put you to death too. Well, how close do you want to be? John chose to be right there with him. Peter chose to follow afar off. John gives Peter access. He's like, no, no, no. Hey, let, let this guy in. He's okay. Let, let him in. And we allow for that. And you know what? There's going to be people who aren't as spiritually grown. Now, you can't say the apostle Peter wasn't spiritually grown. I mean, he was. He knew what he was doing. He, as one of the apostles and spending so much time with Jesus, he, he was grown. He was mature. But not everyone is. And, you know, we're not going to reject those that want to follow Jesus. Hey, if you want to follow Jesus, you know, praise God. But what I'm saying is, you know, get all in. Uh, yeah. It's going to cause you more hardship following afar than it is just being right there with them and just, just being sold out, just going, hey, I'm going to go all the way. Because I'll tell you what, you, you're going to suffer. God's going <laughs> to... If you're going to suffer for Christ, you're going to suffer for Christ. If you're following at all. If you want to follow far off, though, here's the problem is that now you're going to find yourself in condition where not only you're going to be persecuted, but now you're going to have like the weeping bitterly part. Because they'll both come down on you. And, and you think you can avoid stuff. Here's the thing. At the end of the day, you're never going to be able to avoid it. You're going to call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ. You say you believe the word of God. You know, like right now, Things are bad for people who are really outspoken about it. And there's a lot of persecution and there's a lot of people who want to destroy you. But don't think that by, well, I'm not going to say those. Or, I'm going to kind of stay silent. Don't think it's not going to come for you too. If you truly are a follower of Christ, it's going to come to you one day too. It may not be today, but it's going to come. Do you know what? Just decide right now. You know, I'm going to be right there with Christ and not try to follow from afar off and not just try to be like, well, I'm just going to go back here and just see how things play out. Look, you, you're in it. You're born again. You want to follow Christ at all? Get right up there and be close to him. Because here's the other thing. You know, God offered to be your shield, your buckler, your defense, right? 
if that's your defense against this world, how far away do you want to be from that defense? I mean, you think about in a physical war, you go out to a physical battle, and he's talking about being your, your buckler or your shield. I mean, that's a physical object that's going to help defend you. You're out in warfare, you've got the shield, you've got armor, it's going to help protect you. Well, I wouldn't want to have like, or like, you know, you think about David and Goliath. Goliath had this armor bearer. David, Jonathan had an armor bearer. You know, these guys are supposed to help defend while they can go out and be free to attack. And you got these guys who defense. I don't want my armor bearer just like way over there and I'm way over here. I mean, look, the, the, the enemy's right here. I need, def I need the defense now. I need to be close to that def defender, right? So you're going to be better served being right up close to Jesus than you are being farther away. You got to be ready. Let's keep reading here in, in John 18. Verse 16, the Bible says, but, when, but Peter stood at the door without, then went out that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art not thou also one of this man's disciples? He saith, I am not. And notice this, here says his damsel, this is right at the gate. This isn't even when he's gotten to the fire yet, and he's warming himself with everyone else. This is the damsel first right at the gate as he's getting let in. So there's another, you know, another point. But notice he says, there's a damsel. A damsel or a maid, these are young women, okay, girls. You know what happens when you start to try to follow Jesus from afar? You lose your boldness. I mean, come on, Apostle Peter, where's your courage? You've got this little lady, this damsel coming to you and saying, wait, aren't you? Oh, no, 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 not me. Can, can you at least have enough boldness to stand up to a damsel and say, yes, I am, a, I am a follower of Christ. And here's the thing. He already had the encouragement knowing that John was in there. John wasn't pretending to not know Christ. He went in with Christ. And especially when you have other people there that can help encourage you. Hey, they're already leading the way. Go and stand with that man. Go stand next to John. John will help you. John will encourage you. Don't go hanging back with the people warming themselves. Don't go hang out with the bums by the fire, right? <laughs> go, go over there by, by John and be right there for Jesus. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 18, the Bible says, And the servants and officers stood there who made a fire of coals, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself there. He's standing there right with them. Instead of standing with Jesus, he's standing with the people who are warming themselves by the fire. Let's jump down to verse number 25. The Bible says, And Simon Peter stood there and warmed himself. They said therefore unto him, Art thou not also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, saith, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately the cock crew. Turn if you would to Matthew chapter number 10. Peter, who had in his heart to follow afar off, not only abandoned Christ, as I mentioned before, as all the disciples did, but he also denied him. He even denied knowing him. He even denied being associated with him at all, which that's even worse. You know, you run away from Christ. You run away from the battle. People get scared. You know, it happens. We don't have any record of anyone else denying Christ, though, like the apostle Peter did. And here's what the Bible says. Look at verse number 32 in chapter 10. This is what Jesus Christ said. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Now I'll tell you this much, you know, for a saved person, this still applies. This isn't talking about just an unsaved person, you know, being denied. Hey, if you're going to, confess me before men, Jesus is going to confess you before the Father, right? This is for saved people. This isn't talking about losing your salvation, but this is talking about the protection of God, like I was mentioning earlier, 
right? So you, when you're being obedient, when you're being a good child of God, look, we're all born again, right? Everyone who's a believer in Jesus Christ is born again. As a good child, as an obedient child, as someone who's going to confess the Father and confess the Son and say, you know, do the work that, that's set before you to do, Jesus is going to be looking out for you. Just as any good child, when well, my daughter is real good and she's obedient, she's doing everything that she's supposed to be doing, and then she asks, she's in trouble, she needs help, she asks me for anything, she comes to me, well, guess what? She's going she's gonna to be a lot more likely to receive the good, the blessing, the help when she's being good herself than if she's being completely disobedient. I mean, imagine one, just the, the shame and sadness and grief that I would feel as a father if she's like, yeah, we're, we're hanging out here. And she, she meets some new, new friends and someone says, hey, isn't that your dad over there? He's like, no, I don't know who that, no, that's not my dad. No, I'm, I just came in here by myself. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of silly. She's 11 years old, but you know, that, that would, that would one, I mean, first of all, it's going to make me feel terrible. I mean, what is Peter doing to Jesus? Right? He's just looking, he's just thinking about himself. He's just worried about his own skin. Look, why are you even there then? You're, the, the whole reason you're trying to follow far off is because of Jesus. And now you're denying him. He knew what you were doing, which is why he looked at you. What a terrible feeling. I mean, think of a, a friend, family member, anyone just turning their back on you like that. You know what? There's consequences for doing. That's what, that's what the Bible's teaching. I was like, Jesus, you're like, there's consequences. Okay, you want to just just not confess God before man, you're going to deny him. Well, then you know what? Be prepared to be denied yourself. Yeah. When, when the time for the punishment's going to come, God's going to say, all right. Hey, you remember denying me? You're reaping what you've sown. Turn to Acts chapter four. I'll just read this for you. Mark, uh, Mark 8, 38, the Bible says, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the son of man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his father with the holy angels. Now, what other reason, you know, people denying Christ, it's going to at least exhibit some type of shame associated with Christ, right? Oh, I don't, I don't want to be associated with that. Why? Because you think there's some type of shame associated. Well, shame on you if you think there's any shame associated with Christ or the word of God. And especially as you add to this, in this adulterous and sinful generation. I mean, if, we live, if anyone lives in an adulterous, sinful generation, I think, I think we do today. Yes. I mean, the amount of adultery, literal adultery that's going on, divorce rates, everything from people just being super promiscuous and giving themselves over into fornication and now just, just increasingly giving themselves over into strange flesh and weird things. Look, this is an adulterous and sinful generation. And if you're going to be ashamed of what the word of God says, how the word of God is going to, is going to expose the wickedness and, and, and expose it for what it is and teach us how we ought to be responding to these things, look, then shame on you if you're going to be ashamed of the word of God. Yep. Like you're going, to, you're going to take the values of a wicked, adulterous, sinful generation over God. Right. You're going to call the word of God a shame, but that's not. Well, you know what's going to happen? The Son of Man's going to be ashamed of you. And when you choose to try to follow from afar, just follow, oh, I want to follow. I'm just going to be way back here. This is where you're going to find yourself in. Being ashamed of the cause of Christ, uh, not confessing Jesus, and it's only going to get yourself more damage. Your proximity to the Lord and the things of God will have a significant impact on your life. Your proximity, how close you are to God. Following from afar is going to, what, you know what you're going to lack with that? You're going to lack, one, you're going to lack wisdom. You're going to lack boldness, as we saw definitely with, with the Apostle Peter. Yeah. And you're going to lack the fellowship. Because you want to have the best of both worlds, right? You, you kind of want to have that fellowship with the world but then the fellowship with, with the people of God, it's not going to happen. You, you can't serve God and mammon. You're not going to be able to, to enjoy 
either. When you try to have both, you're not going to end up with either. You're either going to have to go the way of the world completely and just good luck with that. Or just get closer with God and with his people. Acts 4, look at verse number 13. This was an observation made by the Pharisees about the, some of the disciples of Christ, about the Apostle Peter, about the Apostle John, right? These two men that, that we're kind of comparing this morning of, with their closeness to Christ at this particular time. The Bible says, verse 13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. So the result of their being with Christ, being close to Christ, being right there with him, even though they were unlearned and ignorant men because they were blue collar workers, they were fishermen, you know, they didn't have the same education that the Pharisees had. But you know what? When you get close to God and they were with Christ, their knowledge increased tremendously. Their wisdom increased. Being taught of God, being taught by the word of God, getting true understanding, true wisdom, truth given to them. Now, all of a sudden, that helps give them the boldness that they need to be able to preach the word of God with confidence and with power. Why? Because they were close to Christ. That's what you get when you get close to Christ. But when you are far off, you're going to be lacking those things. You won't have the confidence. You won't have that boldness. And you're going to start losing that wisdom. That's right. We need to bridge the gap. How close are you? And just take a stock in your own life. How close do you feel like you are to Christ? Just think about that. Where, where are you? Where are you in your walk? How far, how far away are you from following Christ? Now, we all have work to do. No matter where you're at, none of us, none of us are right there. Going, yep, I got my cross. I'm, you know, all these have I kept for my youth up. What, what lack I yet, right? At least hopefully you don't have that attitude. <laughs> we all need to work, but where are you at, right? How are we going to bridge that gap? Well, you know, the Bible says you draw nigh unto God. He'll draw nigh unto you. Amen. So you got to get it right in your heart, first and foremost. But then you got you to also put in the action, right? You don't want to be like one of these people that draw nigh to God just with their lips. Yep. Everybody says they want to be close to God. Everyone who thinks there is a God would say they want to be close to God. Just like the Pharisees. But this is in, in Matthew 15, uh, verse 7. You don't have to turn there. The Bible says, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines and commandments of men. There's, there's plenty of people that, look, they'll say all day long, Oh yeah, the Lord, we want to serve God. But their heart isn't in it. They don't really care. They don't want to be in it. They want to have their cake and eat it too. They, they like being able to, to do the things that they do. That's why Jesus warned them and said, hey, look, you know, the things that the Pharisees teach you that do and observe, but, but don't do after them because they're hypocrites. They're not even going to lift up their finger and do any of that work. They, they, their, their love isn't real. They don't have a real love for God. They want to say all these great things, but it's not real. And God knows your heart and he's going to know if you're fake. So where does getting close to God start with? It starts with your heart. Starts with your heart. You want to draw an eye unto Jesus. Get your heart right. Don't just say you want to do it. Get your heart in it. Now, there are other things that you can do. Just If you just think about it, how are we going to get closer to God? Well, how about you can start by hearing more from him, listening to him. How am I going to listen to God? Um, let me introduce you to the word of God. So I'm not hearing voices. You don't have to. No, I, I'm, I'm glad. I, good. I don't want you to hear voices. I hope you're not hearing voices. We have this voice right here, the voice of the shepherd. Okay, the word of God. This is how you're going to hear from God. Do you know how you're not going to hear from God? All right, let's go. Uh, you want to catch a football game today? You want to go out and hang out? Go hang out with our buds. We'll go do something, do this, do that. And you don't actually open it. And start reading it. 
You need to hear from God. You want to get close to God? Start listening to him to get the instruction that he's trying to give you. He's already given us. How about you communicate with him more? How do we do that? Through prayer. You speak to God. You want to, you, I mean, it, it, this just makes sense. You want to get close to anyone. You want to have a good relationship with someone. How about good communication, right? You want to get closer to your spouse? Well, that can start by having good communication. Listen to what they're saying and speak to them, right? You got to have that, that two-way street there. It, it, it's so basic and elementary and simple, but you know, you have a lot of Christians out there that'll say, oh yeah, it's all about the relationship and everything else. It's like, when's the last time you've read the Bible? You think you have this great relationship with God and you're not hearing a word he says because you've made up this idea of God in your mind and you're not hearing from him at all and you think everything's great and it's not. You need to hear from him. You need to talk to him. How about getting in church, getting among God's people. Now, getting among God's people is going to help you get close to Christ. I'll turn if you to Hebrews chapter 10. But you say, well, getting, you know, I want to, I just like what follow from afar. I like just watching online. Here we go. You ready for the comments to come in? <laughs> You don't understand. Look, you need to get in a good church. Peter and James and John, all the disciples, they didn't virtually follow Christ. They didn't like his Facebook page and subscribe to his channel. They were like literally physically there with him doing the work. That's how you were a disciple of Christ. Okay, you, you may want to learn and absorb and stuff. Look, but you, you need to get in the house of God, the pillar and ground of the truth. You need it. And if you don't have anything near you, what are you going to do about it? What is your desire to get close to Christ? I mean, at the end of the day, that's, you, you have to decide that for yourself. Good. Let, let me put it this way, because this should be a no-brainer. Should be, right? You think about it. If we were to know of Jesus Christ coming back to this, I mean, this is obviously not even going to happen, but just like Jesus being here right now, walking around, you were to hear about it, and it's not not an antichrist, you know, but um, we see him descend, you know, the second coming of Christ, but for whatever reason, it's not the rapture, and you know he's here. Like, like you say, man, I really want to be by Christ, but, you know, I'm, I'm over here, and he's over there. What are you going to do about that? Like, what are you, you going to go? Make the set? Yeah, you're going to go to him, right? Or you should be like, well, maybe I'll just wait around and maybe he'll come over here as he travels around and hopefully I'll get to see him. Well, how bad do you want to get close to Christ? Right? Now, look, church is the body of Christ. The local church is. Now, if you don't have a congregation, a body of born again, baptized believers to go to, you're not part of an abo a body. We're not Catholics and we don't believe in the Catholic church. Amen. Amen. Pastor Thompson, I'm coming into your church and saying this, but <laughs> I think I'm pretty safe in saying this. We don't believe in the Holy Catholic church. Okay. We don't believe in the apostles creed saying we believe in the Holy Catholic church, right? No. I was forced to memorize that as a kid. No, <laughs> it's not sticking with. It's not a universal church. Okay, you're not just part, you're like, well, I'm just part of the church because I'm saved out here in the middle of nowhere and I just have no one to congregate with. Well, look, you know what? You're in sin then. Now, in the Old Testament, here's what the Bible says. You're in Hebrews chapter 10, say there. The Bible says in, in Exodus 33, verse 7, and Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went out under the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. Now, Moses could have made it real simple and just said, hey, you're going to have the tabernacle of the congregation right, right within the camp. And let's just make it easier that everybody can just get here 
And then you can wake up like two minutes before church. You just get out there and just be like, hey, we're right, right around the corner. We got it right here. They specifically put it outside the camp and say, you know what? No, you want to go follow the Lord. You have to go over there. It's not just right outside your front door. You have to go and make it a point and say, I'm going to go to the congregation of the tabernacle. Right off the bat, that's going to, you know, it's going to weed some people out. Because God isn't just interested in just, well, everyone welcome. Look, God wants as many people to be saved and come and attend church as possible. It's going to be done his way. Deuteronomy 12.5, and it's not just any building that calls itself a church or any group of people that calls themselves a church that's, that's where you just go to. Well, what's the closest one to me? I mean, it amazes me sometimes people will ask, like, literally, asking me, and, I, and, you know, my name isn't out there that much. The only way people are going to find out about me at all pretty much is going to be if you've heard anything about new IFB. So it's just like people are going, hey, can you recommend a good church in my area? And it's like they're like 20 minutes away from our church. <laughs> like, <laughs> no. Yeah, how about Stronghold Baptist Church, right? <laughs> That's what I can recommend to you. But it's this mindset of thinking that like, well, I need, I, I mean, that's too far. Right? Well, hey, if you, if you need transportation, we'll help you out with that. And honestly, I mean that because I mean, some people may not have the transportation. Look, if there's, if there's something we can do to help you out with that, of course. But that's not the mindset of most people. It's just laziness. It's just, what is it going to cost? It's just, well, that's just too much for me. I don't want to do that. Well, how close do you want to be to the truth? How close do you want to be to serving the Lord? Because I tell you what, when you get in the right church, when you get in a good church, you're going to have plenty of opportunity to serve God and your spiritual life is going to grow tremendously just by being in the right church. What is that worth to you? And when your spiritual life is growing, guess what? You're getting closer to Jesus. When you're getting challenged to read your Bible more, to go out and preach the gospel, to, to live a sanctified, holy, separated life, getting sin out of your life. Look, all these things are going to bring you closer to Christ. And if you really want to get close to Christ, well, why don't you join yourself among a group of people who feel the same way that can encourage you and edify you and love you and help you to get closer to God? Good. Is it worth the sacrifice? Because not every building, not every church is equal. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 12, 5, but unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall ye seek, and thither thou shalt come. I guarantee you during the, these Old Testament times, there, was people that, there were people that were closer that were, that were constructing places of worship to go and, and assemble themselves together throughout all of the land of Israel. There were people who weren't true followers of the Lord. There are plenty of people out there that had their own religion, and they were probably saying, you know what, let's make it easier. How about Dan and Beersheba? You know what I'm talking about. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Hey, let's make it easier on you. Don't go down to Jerusalem. Go over here. That's right. There's always people around there that's going to do that. Oh, this is going to be more convenient. Oh, look, it's kind of the same, right? I mean, it's basically the same. It's still the Lord. I mean, it's a calf, but you know what? That's we're just symbolizing who the Lord is. We hey, we still have sacrifices. We have an altar. They're not all equal. You go to the place that God has chosen out. You find churches, local churches. You say, hey, is this a candlestick in God's eyes? Is this a church that's bringing forth light? Is this a church that's doing the work of God? Does God recognize this as a church? Because if not then that's not the place that God has chosen out Amen. for a name for himself in the New Testament churches. Right. And if you don't have one of those places around you, maybe you should see, look, God's the one that builds the church. God adds, adds members to the church as he sees fit. Everybody has a function. Everyone has a job. God has work for every single one of you. He's added to this church members. And you have different talents and skills and abilities that God has given for you to help the whole body that meets together to function properly. You've got fingers and toes and knees and elbows and you know, all these different parts of the body. And God places members as he sees fit. Amen. And God has a job, I believe, for every single believer, every person in this world. Saved and unsaved alike. The unsaved need to get saved because job is, God's got a job for them. And the saved, God's already got a job for you too. 
Well, you know where it's going to start? Getting in a body. Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse number 24. The Bible says, And let us consider one another to provoke with love and to good works. Church is so much more than just preaching. This is why I, I discourage the, well, I just, I'm just going to listen on, online. I'm just going to watch YouTube. It's more, it, it's more than just a sermon. It's, it, there's, it, it's more than even just listening to the, even if you were to sing at home and stuff. Look, I'm all for the ability, and, and, and I thank God that we live in a time where you could, you could still have this. It's a great uh, uh, extra thing to have. It's great if you're ill, if you're sick, you're at home. I mean, today, literally, my family, some of my children are sick, and my wife's at home with them. But thank God she's able to get something. She's able to tune in. Hey, thank God we're able to reach some people with these messages and get the message out there and have kind of a bigger podium to go and get a message out. Praise the Lord. But that's not where it should stop with you. And, and settle for being satisfied with calling this church by watching church online or on your TV set. That's not church. You can get some benefit from it. You get some value from it, but it's not being in church. My wife was not in church this morning. But she did listen to it. She gained something, I'm sure, from listening, but she was not in church. Now, she didn't forsake it, <laughs> but there's a big difference, right? A big difference. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, 24, let's read it again. Let us consider one another to provoke and love, because that's what you get. People loving you and provoking you into, into good works and helping you, and encouraging you and strengthening you and being there for you as a church family because we're all brothers and sisters in Christ here. Amen. But then verse 25 says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Let us consider one another so we can program a good love and good works and not forsake the assembling of ourselves. You know what the assembly is? The church. Yep. Not forsaking the church. Not forsaking the assembly. Well, what does it mean to forsake? Look, you determine that for yourself. Is it going Every, all three services every week, not going missing one service out of a whole month. No, I mean I think that's kind of ridiculous. It, but but here's the thing: people want to say, "Well, what is it then? Is it just going once a month? Well, what about six times a year? Well, what about once? A year? Look, how close do you want to be? Do you want to find that line of where you're in sin of forsaking the assembly?" Or do you just want to make sure that you don't even have to think about that? Because as the Bible says here in verse 25, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Do we see the day of Christ approaching? Yeah. I mean, is that the, is anyone going to say, no, nah, no, I don't think it's day of Christ. <laughs> no, it's not like getting like Sodom and Gomorrah. It's not like the days of, no. look, the day is approaching. The Bible says we need to not forsake the assembly. We need to be in the assembly so much the more as we see the day approaching. It's needful for us. We need to be here. One more point. Well, one more page. Sorry, did you, is anyone here familiar with my preaching at all? Okay, you, you weren't expecting a short sermon, were you? <laughs> Sorry. Good. I'm glad, I'm glad we're on the same page. It's never my intent to go very long. I'll just let you know that. But it just always seems to happen that way. We just open up the Bible and it happens. So We want to get close. We want to get close. We don't want to serve God afar. Obviously, being in church is extremely important. Hearing from God. Praying to God. Well, how about winning other people to Christ? How about loving other people? You want to be close to Christ? Well, what did Christ do? He came not to be served, but to serve. Not to be ministered unto, but to minister. That was his role. That was his job. That's our job too. We're here to serve others. We're here to serve people. So you want to be more Christ-like? You want to get close to Christ? Be more like him in his mission and what he was called to do and what he's already commanded us to do in the Great Commission. Jesus is the one that said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me. Well, how close are you following? Well, are you a fisher of men? Ooh. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. 
but you're not a fisher of men. Let's see, is Jesus wrong? <laughs> Did he forget to say something else? Did he leave something out? Or do we actually have his thought here and what he's what he teaching saying, follow me and I'll make you fish as many. He actually meant that. And that's real and that's true. Huh. Yeah, I'll let you chew on that one for a while. He also said this in Matthew 12, 30, he that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. How close are you going to follow Jesus Christ. Let's close with this. Turn back, if you would, to the Gospel of John. Go to John chapter 13. I just want to show you the benefits of being close. Okay, we saw what happened to the Apostle Peter when he chose to follow Jesus afar off. It didn't end well. Now, thankfully, he was able to get back on the horse, as it were, get back right with God, get back in the service of God, and continue to do many great things for God. He got back close again. He backslid, he stumbled, he fell, and then got right back up again and continued to serve. That's a, the, another amazing thing about the Lord, his graciousness, long-suffering, mercy. Look, he gives us space to be able to repent and be able to say, okay, you know what, God, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that anymore. And, and to the best of my knowledge, Apostle Peter just lived out the rest of his days just serving the Lord faithfully, never denying him ever again. Okay? It happened, but here's the thing. We're, we're looking out so it doesn't happen to us. Well, how did it happen? He started following afar off. He lost that proximity. He, he really gained, you know, fell back, backslid away from the Lord, and then he had this big gap in between him and God. Now let's look at the, the benefits of the one who didn't, the one who got right back there close immediately, the Apostle John. John is the one who had more things revealed unto him. Look at John 13, verse 23. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. This is Apostle John. He's so close to Jesus, he's right up there, like has physical contact. He's leaning on his bosom. Like he's just right up there with him. That's close. Okay, it's being close with Christ. And it says, uh, Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. This is when Jesus said that one of them is going to betray him. Right at the, at, the, at the Last Supper. They're there. Jesus says one of them is going to betray him. And Peter's like, hey, John, ask him. Ask him. Who is it? Why is he asking, why is he asking himself? Because John is the closest one. Yeah. John is right there. He's the one that's going to get the inside information since he's so close. Look, don't you want to be the one that's that close to Christ? I do. I want to be so close that people could be the one looking to you to be like, hey, what is it that Christ wants me to do? What is it that Christ is talking about? What, you know, he's looking to him for information, for wisdom, for guidance, for understanding. Hey, hey, ask him. He'll answer you. Why? Because you're close to him. I want to be that person. He then lying on Jesus' breast saith unto him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus tells him. Jesus answered, he it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. So John is close to Christ. He asks, and Jesus answers. Now, John might not have fully understood that. I don't know. I mean, you could look at this, and they still, they, it, what the Bible says is that they didn't understand why he said, that thou doest do quickly. I don't necessarily think, though, that John didn't know that it was Judas, because it literally happened. He didn't know to what intent Jesus spake unto him, that thou doest do quickly, but whether he understood it or not, Jesus told him. Jesus said, hey, look, this is who it is. Why did he answer him? Because he asked because he was close. He revealed it unto him. But not only in this case, I mean, think about this. John is the one that received the revelation. Yeah. The revelation of Jesus Christ, the last book of the Bible. The revelation of St. John the Divine, right? If you read it, in, <laughs> depending on what titles your, your Bible say. But look. It, the, it was revealed unto John the things that are going to happen. Okay, he, he had this, this great blessing of wisdom. You've got the book of John, you've got 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, those epistles, and you've got the book of Revelation, and tons of information and wisdom given to John. Why? As a result of him being close to Jesus. 
Not only did he have that wisdom, but you know what also was given unto him? Great honor and responsibility. Turn if you to John chapter 19. John chapter 19, as someone who is beloved of the Lord, was close with the Lord, this is who Jesus turned to to entrust the safety and welfare of his own mother, his physical, his earthly mother on this earth. What a great honor. John 19, verse 25, the Bible says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. Jesus had to choose one person to care for his family after his departure. And he chose John. John is the one that's called beloved. John's the one that leaned on his breast. John's the one who he told about Judas Iscariot. John's the one who's getting the revelation. John's the one that's close to Jesus. That's where we want to be. Last place, John 21. Because at the end of the day, look, we, we all want to be that apostle John as far as the proximity to Christ, being right there with Christ. But don't get caught up and don't get caught up on anyone else. We compared John and Peter a lot. And look, as I'm, I started off the sermon stating the Apostle Peter, Apostle John, I can't compare myself to them. I think they're both just amazing, awesome, you know, believers that have done tremendous amounts of work for Christ. You know, we look at these stories and it's easy to pick apart the Apostle Peter, right, because of what we did. But look, this was given unto us for instruction. He's not trying to bash that person and be like, oh, look how horrible Peter was. Look, he did, he did sin. He was wrong. But we want to learn from his mistakes. Yes, Everything that's written in here, we're going to take and add more to our wisdom. Yep. And it's not to look on anyone here and say, oh, well, John's better than Peter. Peter's better. Look, it's not, that's not it at all. You're missing the whole point if you're thinking that you're, oh, you're saying, so you're saying John's better than Peter? No, I'm not saying he's better. I'm saying he was closer to Christ. I'm not saying he was better. Okay, now look, we all have our own walk. We all have our own mission. We all have our own work to do. And as the Bible says, you know, talking about the body of Christ, look, don't look at some other member and think, oh, well, I'm not valuable because I'm not the eye and I'm not the, the hand or whatever. And I'm do, I've got this job and someone else has that job. Don't worry about that. Even the apostle Peter, look, he knew that John was close to Jesus which is why he even had him ask about Judas, about who he was talking about. But then we see Peter too. I mean, he knows all this. And when Peter gets his instruction from Jesus Christ, he's ended up will say, well, what about this guy? Well, what about John? Don't worry about John. Look what Jesus said. Look at John 21, verse 19. The Bible says, this spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. Talking about the apostle Peter, Jesus prophesied the death that he was going to have to glorify Christ his mission, his end, what he was going to end up doing. God gave him his instructions. Jesus tell him, this is what's going to happen to you. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, follow me. This is last words. This is what's going to happen to you. Follow me. Then Peter turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter seeing him saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? So now he's just worried about, well, what's, what's John going to do? I mean, he's the guy that was close to you. What's, Jesus said unto him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. So he's saying, look, if, if I want him to just be alive until I come back again, none of your business. So he's saying, none ya. And what shall this man do? None ya. None ya business. Follow me. Right? Worry about your own work. Worry about your own self. How about you just try getting close to me, Peter? Because Christ can have a close relationship with more than one person. It doesn't just have to be the Apostle John. How about you follow me and you get right up close to me too? There's room at Jesus' bosom for you to rest your head too, Peter. And there's room for you. So don't worry about getting jealous or, or envious of, of someone else. And, and they're, whoa, they're, they've got this, they're so close to Christ. Look, why don't you just emulate that and say like, look, I want to be there too. 
and then and then work on your own to get there. Focus on your work and, and what you need to do to get to that point. And I say the more people that are that close to Mary are great. Amen. Praise the Lord. I wish all 12 of the disciples were that close, except for Judas, you know. <laughs> the 11 and Matthias, <laughs> right? You know, as it were, any, uh, everyone. There's room there, but look, we, you know, what are you going to do? Challenge yourself how close you want to be to Christ. Do you want to try to follow him from afar? I don't think it's a good idea. Get all in. Dedicate yourself to serving him. You know, the Bible calls the sacrifice of ourselves our reasonable service. Like, that's all of you. That's, this, is what, this is what God sees of you. And you know what? Yeah, you just dedicate everything that you have and all that you do to him. Yeah, it's reasonable. And it is. Okay, anyone here that's born again, tell me how that's not reasonable. Anyone here who is saved from an eternity in hell, tell me how that's not reasonable. Wait, did, did Christ save your soul and, and cleanse you of all of your sins and give you, grant you forgiveness and give it to you as a free gift? But it's not reasonable to, to say, oh, I'm going to make any sacrifice on my own to now try to serve you. We owe him everything. We can never repay him, but you know what we could do? We could try to love him and, and follow him and, and follow his commandments and do what he said and, not, and, and in no way shy away or back off or be ashamed of his word in this sinful and wicked and adulterous generation that we live in. The Christ that bled and died for you don't ever be ashamed of his word, ever. Every single verse of the Bible, including every verse of Leviticus, every verse of Deuteronomy, all of it is God breathed. All of it is, is from the Lord. Okay. And none of it is bad. It is all good. And we should stand on every single word as a sure foundation. Bow our eyes, have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, love you. Thank you so much for the great gift that you've given us, for saving us, dear Lord, for, for cleansing us from our sin, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to, uh, to serve you better. We all want to be close to you, Lord, and um, help us to have the, the, the wisdom and understanding as we read from your word, as we hear from your word, dear God, open up your truths to us. Help us to, to have the strength and the courage to, to keep moving forward. Even though there is... Uh, uh, a lot of things going on in our society, in the world, maybe even in the area, dear Lord, of people threatening and um, trying to, to get those that follow you to, to step back or to not be associated with the word of God, dear Lord. But I pray that you would please help all of us to stand together and encourage one another to, to be strong and to, and to worship you and to get as close as possible to you, dear Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray these things. Amen.